Ah, yes. Mm. Welcome, I'm Christian. This is Lazy Devs procedural generation. Yep, that's what's happening today because we're doing a roguelike. And uh, this is my third coffee, by the way, just just so you know how dedicated I am to this. And it's not even like three o'clock. <laughs> ah, great. So today we are going to do procedural generation, but also I wanted to talk about, let's talk. Let's have the procedural generation talk. We already started having this talk, but we I think we have to like finish up this talk. Procedural generation is not solving your game design problems. Let me repeat this. Procedural generation will not solve your game design problems. That's something I'm talk I'm saying to you out there, but I am also saying to me personally. There's like, like no a little Christian, that the devil Christian inside saying like, this is not true, say it's not so. Um, I did it wrong last time around I made this 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 program. Generally I made roguelikes. Um, just so you know, I never actually submitted anything to the seven day roguelike. Not, not quite sure, I, I submitted it last year. Uh, it wasn't finished. Why? Because I started with a procedural generation. I did not start with my gameplay and so when I was done with procedural generation and I actually got to the gameplay I realized oh no oh no <laughs> I got stuck doing the gameplay stuff um, because I kind of like exhausted myself doing procedural generation and I also like realized that maybe my procedural generation wasn't really the right thing the, the, the dungeon I generated wasn't the right thing for my gameplay I should have spent more time working on the gameplay making sure that gameplay works fun that's fun to use with a not procedural generated procedural generated level and then add procedural generation on top and that's generally that's something which we did as computer community computer game uh, player community you might remember uh, uh, No Man's Sky that was kind of like a watershed moment for a lot of people where it's like oh my gosh procedural generation that's the best thing ever it was so great in diablo it's so great in minecraft it's always the best it's so good it just creates gameplay man it's like it's like um binding of isaac spelunky you know all those really great games that use procedural generation to great extent and and create like a super deep gameplay so surely no man's sky is going to be the best hype machine and everything and then people saw um, no man's sky and it's like the i think the problem with no man's sky wasn't that the game was bad it was great i loved it myself when it came out and it actually i, I kind of like the, don't like it as much anymore now that it's kind of like adding all the minecrafty stuff because i kind of like just like chilling out and walking through the planets but a lot of people had like this incredibly elevated expectation of what procedural generation can do in this kind of situation where like what kind of variety it creates and so there was a big disappointment and alas there was like a lot a lot of for a lot of people it was like this um moment where like it flipped where now suddenly procedural generation is seen not quite as something that's that great and so yeah um so this is something that should doubly be the case for you as a game designer where it's like it should be a, a tool in your box but you shouldn't um, trust it too much. It shouldn't. It definitely shouldn't expect it to solve your gameplay problems. You should make sure that your game is playable and works fine before you tackle the procedural generation. And again, it's one of those things where it's like, do as I say, not as I do, because again, I did it wrong last time around. Um, maybe before we jump into procedural generation, um, I wanted to, because I actually it's probably the best if we do that. Let us make a level. That let us let, let us give ourselves this goal that every time we do procedural generation, every time we think, ah, let's do procedural, it sounds good. Uh, that we give give ourselves the permission only to go for it once we had one level that is fun to play. One level that's fun to play. And surely, um, we can come up with a level now that we have all those mechanics that is going to be interesting and enjoyable and everything, right? So, so let's try to pull this off. Let's try to make a level that's interesting. Um, so yeah, let's try to do like a vase here. Let me be like something like here. Then over here, I'm trying to come up with some kind of labyrinth situation. Oh, zooming out is not helping us at all. Um, 
obviously this is going to be a bit of an uh, not as exciting for us as um, as the game designers because we know of course already know the layout and everything like there's no mystery involved here um, but you know maybe we can like I just want to make sure that we can it's semi-interesting it's just like at least like even if you don't know exactly where to go and how to go about things that we can kind of figure out things for us um, so yeah, I'm just creating a bunch of rooms. Maybe the rooms are a little bit too big. Maybe they should be a bit smaller. I'm not sure. Maybe like there's like a hallway here and there's the entrance to that hallway is in here. Yeah, that seems good. Um, and then there's gonna be like the second exit here. That seems good. And then maybe there's gonna be a door here. Why not? And then here and here. Something like this, things like that. And let's make a door here. So the, I want to have like some interconnected rooms. I think that's something that um, that you get wrong a lot of times is that the rooms are not really well interconnected. And then it's like really easy just like to go through the exit and then it's like, okay, I'm done, I guess. Okay, so something like this. So um, now I'm gonna ask, uh, wait, so there, there's this hallway here that that hallway leads nowhere. So let's put up a door here as well. Okay, so um, maybe this door is closed. How about that? That might be good. And then I'm going to put in a door here. So there's going to be a chest here, a chest here. That's fine. I want to put a chest here. And then a bunch of vases here. I love, I love the vases, they're so good. Mm -hmm. like, so it's a really big starting room here. Or maybe the vases are gonna be here along the wall because I wanna I don't wanna like put the vases in front of the door. I think that's it's good if you can just like walk right into. Um Yeah. And then now it's gonna be like about where to put the enemies. So let's put the enemies like here and here. There's going to be two enemies here, there's going to be three enemies here, maybe one close and the other one's far away. And then obviously a bunch of enemies all the way here in the in the ending, three enemies here. No enemies here is good, then it's going to be one enemy here. Yeah, that's, that's going to be kind of like my, my level. And then let's, uh, maybe um, some more vases down the line, like maybe a vase here. And here, yeah, that seems good. Okay, a um, couple of details that I want to fix before we continue is, I mean, don't worry, we got to get, get to procedural generation. But again, I still I want to have like, I want I want I want the the game to work uh, before we we tackle this. Um, and this also gives us a little bit of an idea of you know what we want to expect from procedural generation. We're going to make the map blank. That's good. And um, also, um, we actually want to get some things from the chests. Um, so I already talked about how, you know, we cannot actually really do it really well here because that's going to be up to procedural generation to take care of, you know, what kind of objects we're getting exactly. And also, we don't really have that many objects. So we just have like some placeholder objects, but not really like, wow, this is like some really interesting, create some really interesting gameplay. So this is something that we kind of like still have to do. Um, but still, I think there's still some, like, we can just imagine, you know? So, like, when you bump the chest, I want to get, like, a take, uh, or is it get, get item or take item? I forgot. Uh, or was it here? Mobs and items? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, take item. Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, so, something like um, local eat ITM equals floor random number of items how many items do we have what is it? let's say item name right oh man <laughs> uh, item name there we go and then plus one yeah that gives us an uh, item and then take item itm and then um, show a message uh, item name item just showing a message with the name of the item like that 
and we're gonna do the same thing. That's gonna be the chest. And when we break a vase, um, you also get a random item, but not always. So it's gonna be if RND three is smaller than one, then just one in three vases gives you an item. Maybe let's go for one, one in four. Yeah, I got a rusty sword from that. Uh, it's not disappearing. Uh, why is it not disappearing? Do I have to specify? Uh, yeah, we have to specify. Okay, so let's let's show one for like sixty frames. Um, sixty frames. Sixty frames. Just like this, and it's going to be horrible because we're going to get a lot of rusty swords, and we actually want to have like. Um, you know, it's, now we got leather armor, so we can equip it. That's good. Ninja star, leather armor, <laughs> so another leather armor. Red bean paste, that's good. Um, so we can throw away the leather armor, but so far that's good. So we can open up this here. Let's go this way, way around. So now uh, we have to this thing where we can bump against the wall and the enemies will approach us. So that will actually solve a lot of the problems that we have. So maybe let's, let's try to imp implement this little detail because I kind of like this. Um, I'm gonna have like a function here that will be basically just like, um, or like a f variable that will be like skip AI, skip AI, and it usually it's false. But if we um, bump against a wall, we're gonna set it to true. So uh, we're gonna uh, play the bump animation, but the AI won't get a turn. Um, so um, where is it? Tools, draws, tools, uh, updates. Yeah. So it's like here, update game. And when you do the animation P turn, um, then if check and and not skip AI, then do AI. Mm, maybe maybe well, let's let's do something like this. Uh, if skip AI, then skip AI equals false. Else do AI. And then when we are the gameplay is when we're gonna bump, um, move player trick bump, right here. So if there's something happening, yeah, do here's trick bump, right? So if trick bump, we're gonna actually tell um, this function here if the trick bump is actually triggered something. If trick bump, uh, if not trick bump, then skip AI equals true. Uh, we could, we can make it more efficient later on. I'm gonna put a star here and it's also an update function. I think there's, there's, there's ways of doing this more efficient. I'm just like want to have something happening here. So like it, all of these things is like, okay, something happened, but otherwise return false. And on all of these, we're gonna return true. Uh, actually, we don't want to return, like reading the tablet shouldn't, shouldn't make the AI take a turn. Uh, but opening a door, definitely. Opening a chest, definitely. And uh, smashing a vase as well. So let's try to do this now. Ninja, broadsword. Okay, so we have a broadsword. So you can see now, oh, actually, no, bumping the wall will do things. Why? Mm, why, man? Um, let's do a debug. It's kind of funny because we're doing like this kind of like little test here, but it takes us, of course it takes us, um, probably will take us another uh, entire episode, but it's fine. So skip AI equals false and it's not get, getting set to true. What the? Trick bump, trick bump. If not trick bump, then, oh wait, no, that's fine. Let's let's uh, let's let's do something like this. I want to see what happens. Equals this. 
or let's like let's do something like local test equals trick bump. We're gonna trigger this thing. I just want to see what comes out of trick bump. I'm I'm not trusting this trip trick bump. And if not test, then skip AI, right? Something like this. Let's try that. Um, okay, so let's see. It returned true. But now I'm bumping the wall and it doesn't return true. Okay, so apparently this not doesn't get executed if I bump the wall. Ah, got it. Oh man, I'm I'm be, I feel a bit silly. Yeah. Okay, so we actually don't need this because this basically means that that this is just for tiles that actually have some kind of use. So we actually can be like, okay, just trigger it. It's fine. But otherwise, if the tiles doesn't have any use, there is no the flag one is the I thought it was the flag one was the red one, but flag one is the orange one. The orange one means that you know that this tile is yellow, so there is some kind of use associated with it. Um, so we're gonna go else and so if the, the, this, this is not yellow, so we bumped a tile that has no use whatsoever, then we actually just gonna skip the AI. So nothing happened, we just like bumped against something that is, has no use. And actually we don't need this return function here anymore. Good, so let's, let's try to test this. Um, so let's try to bump against the wall here. Yeah, now bumping in against the wall won't trigger the 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 enemies anymore. And you actually have to go here and trigger like bump against the um, vase so you can attack them. Good, this is good. Uh, the only thing I want to maybe add is I want to have the um, mobs, the HP of the mobs down to one. And that's going to be it. Uh, we can uh, remove the debugging stuff. Um, debug here, here. And, and that's going to be it. Yeah, let's try. Let's, so let's try to, to finish this level now. So I'm going to break all the vases and get no items whatsoever. What a bad luck. Okay, so now this guy is following me. So I have to like retreat now. Bump against this wall opening, but now a new wall opens. So this guy approaches. So I have to actually run towards him now. This guy lost me. So maybe I can like, hey, buddy. So now I can have to kind of like use the wall strategically. I'm gonna equip the sword. Broadsword is gonna be even better. Uh, I have to use kind of like the um, the uh, um, doors and vases to kind of like. Um, figure out how do I do the combat. Okay, so now this guy sees me. So if I go forward now, he will attack me. Um, so now I can have to do something. Like I, I could retreat and he will follow me. And I could like use open this door and now attack him. So now there's like more stre strategy going on here. So let's see about these guys. So again, this guy is following. So I will open this chest, giving me the rusty sword, and also this guy walks toward me. So now, for example, I could like use this vase, but I could also you could, you could eat the reed bean paste. Uh, that won't give me anything, but I kind of like know that it heals me, and I can attack him, and um, that kind of like fixes the. Uh, this, that's the kind of like I was the thing I was talking about this um, Zugzwang, or um, parity. Uh, kind of combat stuff. Uh, I have a lot of swords. <laughs> okay, so the, now there is no way for me to fix parity or fix Zugzwang. Uh, I could look, uh, walk all the way back to the door, but that kind of like... there is no, So that would be maybe a, a thing to consider. Like maybe there's some kind of penalty if you take too many steps in any given turn. So that's something that I would maybe write down at this point. Like maybe there's some way of, of punishing me. Uh, but I feel like right now, like walking all the way back to this one door to fix uh, Zugzwang, Oh, is already kind of enough of a punishment. Uh, so I will actually take the, the hit now. I cannot bump the wall. I will take the hit. I will do a, do a step forward. The enemy gets an attack on me. I'm going to actually go back now. So I don't get smashed by two enemies. And then I can smash this enemy and this enemy. And now again, this enemy is here. Ah, oh, man, maybe I should have stayed inside the uh, the room because there are vases inside and they, that they can help me fixing 
Zugzwang. So you can see there's actually some interesting strategic considerations going on, even though now I exactly know how the level works and everything. And again, with the leather armor, this level, um, I might have gotten, gotten away with this level without losing any lives. So yeah, it works. This is something that works. That's something that we can we can um, summarize. So maybe uh, sorry that we that we didn't do any procedural generation at the same after all. But we, maybe you can talk about procedural generation um, because there is like um, we're going to talk about the algorithm that we're going to use in the next episode. We're going to start with the algorithm so that you know. First of all, I think a very another very important thing about, about procedural generation is that the complexity of the algorithm it doesn't really relate necessarily to the results. So sometimes a very simple algorithm will create an excellent result and a very complicated algorithm will be like, uh, uh, I don't really see, you know, the extra effort that you put into this algorithm. I don't see it actually coming out of it. Let me show you what I mean. So this is a very well-known algorithm uh, from the game Spelunky. And this is a um, really good breakdown of, of the Spelunky algorithm. There's two really good sources for you to figure out how Spelunky algorithm works. We're not going to use this algorithm, but just like an example of how this can work. So this is Darius Kazemi. Uh, there we go, Darius, Darius Kazemi. And if you Google Spelunky generator lessons or the Spelunky Darius Kazemi, you will find this like a multiple step process of him breaking down exactly how the algorithm works. Generally, mm, Derek Hugh, the creator of Spelunky, wasn't a good programmer. Uh, actually, he does, he's, not, he do, he's probably a good programmer, but he doesn't consider himself a good programmer. So he, uh, he was a lazy dev, <laughs> the dev uh, uh, you know, um, of my taste. And so he picked, instead of picking like a very complicated algorithm that creates caves and kind of understands how, how the gameplay works, he made an algorithm that basically takes prefabricated rooms and arranges them like in a snake kind of fashion. That's what he kind of does. He like, has like different types of rooms. Um, they can have some variations. There are some tiles in those rooms marked as being like, oh, this could be a wall, but it could be also something else. And then he generates kind of like this kind of snaky pattern, filling the rooms um, like this. And you can see Darius Kazemi kind of breaks this down. He actually has like a generator here where you can um, you can press R and it will generate a different level. So you can see the generator working and you can see how this works, how, how it generates different rooms. Um, and this is now, I guess, like at this point, it's known as the Spelunky algorithm um, because it's not really like, it's not an algorithm that kind of like digs into the matter that operates on an individual tile kind of basis. It, do, it does a little bit of that, but not too much, like the general structure of the level. It has like repeating rooms that are arranged with together. Um, but even so, even even though it's kind of like this simple uh, algorithm, it still generates really good levels. And when you're playing it, you rarely notice that, oh, wait a minute, this room looks exactly like the room that I just had like previously. Like the, the excitement of the game generally uh, also not, doesn't, really, doesn't really come from the specific geometry of the level, but also, you know, how the different elements inside this level, like enemies, and items, how they generate gameplay. So, you know, Derek Hugh is able to get away with something like very easy and it's, it's fine, it's perfect. It's, it's, it couldn't be like, it's, it's even hard to imagine an algorithm that is like operating on a, you know, just carving out the cave and like placing stuff, doing a better job than this. And it's so easy to, to, to implement this. Um, so we could do this as well. Um, I don't want to make this though. Um, by the way, if you if like reading a text is not good for you, there's also a video by um, Game Maker's Toolkit, Mark Brown. He also does like a video, seven minute video breaking down the algorithm. Doesn't go into coding very much, but um, but also explains how this works. So that's fine. We are going to use this other algorithm that I found. This is this one algorithm is by Bob Nystrom, by a blog by no Bob Nystrom. He wrote it in 2014. Uh, it's a guy, he actually published, I guess, game programming patterns. Okay, so he has like this blog post where he breaks down a generation algorithm for like a typical top-down roguelike dungeon. Um, and I like this one because unlike Spelunky, it's actually it's creating the... Um, the level is more freely. Spelunky is kind of just like this grid pattern where it's like rooms are arranged in a grid pattern. And sometimes they're bigger and smaller, but you can't like you see kind of like the grid pattern, which is fine for Spelunky because you are having like this platformer where it's fine to have multiple floors. 
um, but for us we have like a very tight level and I want you know uh, I wanted to the level to not look as samey um, to, to it's, it's gonna be we, you're gonna see parents anyway so I want to have like at least more variation here happening and this the generator is really great for this so first this first step is gonna well this is the entire generator so we're gonna generate some rooms and labyrinths in between so let us break down um, and then <laughs> we're gonna connect all of the rooms here so you can see if you click on this, you can see like the inner um, generator running. But yeah, uh, let's let's just start. Like he describes this generator in, in, in detail. But um, let me like re redraw this this map real quick. This this website. <clears throat> so this is the first step. Just placing a bunch of rooms in a in like carving out a bunch of rooms, not connected, just like squares, making sure the squares not overlap. Obviously, just like freestanding rooms, I always want to have at least one uh, tile of a wall between each room uh, and now this is like really great for him because he has like this really great map big map we only have a tiny map uh, i figured like i think uh, five rooms is the maximum that you can squeeze in comfortably um, we also have to think about what's the minimum size and maximum size of a room i figured a minimum size is like three times three like smaller than three times three is like really doesn't make sense that doesn't feel like a room anymore that's more like a broad hallway <laughs> Uh, and the size, um, I think like this, uh, going about the surface of the room is important. And I think like 25 tiles is like the biggest surface of a room. At some point it gets so big that it's kind of like, uh, it's, it doesn't get interesting, like it doesn't create interesting gameplay. So yeah, we're gonna create a bunch of rooms. Now, how are we gonna connect those rooms? Like a lot of peop people at this point will start like picking the rooms and start like carving straight lines. And that's, I think like how the original uh, rogue rooms were created where it's like carving these passageways where they just go like straight from one room to another and it's like this very boring passages in between and it really works only good uh, this kind of like technique only works only well if there is um, a lot of free space for you to carve those those tunnels in between the the levels right uh, we don't really have that our room's going to be very tightly packed so all of the interconnections all of the hell hallways between the rooms have to be like really creative and 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 tight and so he uses something genius here which i that's why i picked this algorithm because i love this so much so he has a maze generation algorithm something that he has like aside from the rooms he he used this maze generation algorithm there's a lot of those but it's basically kind of like a worm crawling like digging a tunnel and sometimes it makes a turn you know it's just like a worm worming itself through the level and then at some point the worm will be at a dead end where it's like i cannot carve anymore unless unless i want to like make a breakthrough through a through a hallway that i just already created then we're going to stop this worm and we're going to find a new place for a new worm to start digging you know like a um a wall tile that it can remove and like start digging and then we can spawn a bunch of those worms basically until we don't have any spot anymore for a worm to start digging until uh, the entire level has been carved out so it's always you know um uh alternating hallway wall hallway wall like everything is just like this pattern of walls and hallways and there is no two walls next to each other like uh, I, I guess eight walls next to each other where you could set in a worm that could start carving stuff so we would have like this maze here we're going to go to the details later on when you start doing this so you have this um, maze generation algorithm and then so what he does now is he places the room first and then he starts carving the maze in between the rooms so you have like the rooms and then the worms start to start crawling and eating away uh, hallways between the rooms but the hallways won't connect with the rooms yet again the worm is about is always stopping before it break, makes a breakthrough through an empty space um, so you have like now like rooms separated from each other and then hallways also separated from the rooms and from each other you can tell by the colors that you know they they are separate and so here is now the situation where um, we're gonna start like looking for um possible ways of carving doors to connect two areas with each other and you know the two areas could be two rooms or it could be two hallways or it could be a room in a hallway it doesn't matter we're gonna start looking for candidates to carve holes to make this entire level interconnected so every so you can reach any tile from any tile and once the entire level is interconnected connected um now he stops but we're going to continue and we're going to uh, continue carving holes and places where um 
where the distance where you could save a lot of walking if you if there was a wall there so you, the entire level comes becomes a bit more interconnected i'm gonna explain this when we, when we get to that and then when we have like a nice interconnected level then we can think about you know where we put the exit and entrance and then we can start going through all of the rooms that we created at the beginning and decorating them with some 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 you know furniture monsters uh uh, chests, um, vases, you know, all sorts of interesting things. So this is generally the entire process. And it, it seems super complicated. It's like, wow, Jesus, this is so many things. But don't worry, like, um, I think the way it's breaking, broken down in this, in this block is very good because, you know, each step is not that hard. Or at least like each step is manageable. The entire process is super complicated, but we're gonna inch ourselves slowly, step by step. First, on the next episode, let's just start creating a bunch of rooms. We can do that. We can carve a bunch of rooms in a rock. That's gonna be fine. On the next episode, we're gonna create our rooms. As always, the code for this episode with our beautiful first level that works is gonna be in the doobly-doo. Get our t-shirts um, in the shop and also um, visit our Discord channel because, again, people are discussing this. It's a really good Discord channel. See you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.